Hello Horror Hounds, after the wobbly reception of Phenomena, we see Dario Argento do what he has done a couple of times before, return to the safe space of the giallo. With known in the UK as Terror at the Opera, I prefer the original title, simply Opera. When a prima donna is injured, her young understudy, Betty, is thrust into the spotlight in the leading role of a performance of Verdi's Macbeth in the role of Lady Macbeth. Her star-making performance also attracts the attention of a hooded killer, a killer who periodically kidnaps her, ties her up, tapes needles under her eyes and forces her to witness his grisly murders. A killer whom Betty used to have dreams of as a child. Naturally then, opera derives some inspiration from Gaston Leroux's The Phantom of the Opera, especially in the opening few scenes where a uh, prima donna is injured just before opening night, giving her ingenue understudy a shot for stardom, fame and the accolades that come with a leading role. But real life intrudes as well, as we've seen previously in Argento's work. Um, the ballet school setting of Suspiria is inspired by a family story that came from Argento's partner Daria Nicolodi. Uh, Tenebre was inspired by the promotional press circuit that Argento undertook for the promotion of Suspiria as well as the attentions of a stalker fan whilst working in New York on the script for Inferno. Even in Phenomena, a film about a girl who communicates with insects, there are elements of the autobiographical. Uh, Jennifer's story in that about the breakup of her parents' marriage while she was a child is Argento's own from childhood. In real life then, opera derives from Argento's attempt in 1985 to stage a heavily modified version of Verdi's Rigoletto, which was cancelled by the theatre. Uh, in the film, the on-screen director of Verdi's Macbeth is Argento by proxy. In the same way uh, in Tenebre that Patrick Neal, a, a thriller writer, uh, was sometimes an analogue of Argento. Here, Mark is scripted as being a horror movie director. It's mentioned that he did previously direct Rigoletto to critical disdain and he's also accused of being a sadist, aroused by the violence in the film around him uh, as an explanation as to why he makes his horror movies. It's as much a cheeky swipe at himself as it is his critics, I think, and proof, if ever proof were needed, that Argento can laugh at himself, and any pointed criticism of hypocrisy amongst his critics is always served uh, dryly with swipes at himself as well. You saw it in Tenebre, you see it here again in opera. But opera also contains lots of nods to previous Argento films. These days we would call them Easter eggs. There's a moment in Betty's apartment where uh, Mark calls her to the window because someone's looking up at the apartment and the shot down on an empty lonely telephone box instantly calls to mind an almost identical shot in Tenebre. In a later scene also in Betty's apartment with the sound system blaring music out as uh, the woman in peril uh, wanders through her apartment only to have a stabbed man topple out on top of her instantly calls to mind a similar scene in Inferno. And much later on, just before the final act in Betty's dressing room at the Opera House, uh, there's a, a mobile of brightly painted uh, bird ornaments that the camera purposefully pushes in and lingers on. Is this just like the ornamental glass peacock at the very end of Suspiria, intended to be a nod to Argento's first film, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage? In that film too, we thought the killer was dead, only for there to be a final shock attack on the protagonist. And what about that final shock twist ending, where we think the killer's dead, only to find out that they survived? Unashamedly and admittedly lifted straight from the end of Thomas Harris's novel Red Dragon, because Argento was so frustrated that Michael Mann hadn't used it for the ending of Manhunter. It's a very strange coda, suddenly transplanted, miles and miles away up in the cool, clean air of a, a mountain cabin. Mark, now up in the mountains with Betty, uh, is filming a bee on a filament wire, pulling back the sort of magic curtain on how the insect effects were shot 
in phenomena, leading to a bizarre final scene where Betty seems to have a psychotic break and turns her back on the human world and crawls amongst the grass, intending now to live amongst the world of animals and insects. Uh, the setting, the intimate relationship with the insect world, just the very look of the final five or ten minutes seemed more like a lost scene from phenomena rather than anything approximating the feel, tone or subject matter of uh, the preceding film of opera. Argento is still very keen to play up the artificial nature of film storytelling. Towards the start of the film, the opening performance of Macbeth begins as the camera scans the Opera House audience and then moves around the space to turn slowly upon the stage when the screen is then filled with the red curtains which slowly part to show us the start of the opera. The film is a play, a performance. And then we cut to backstage and conceal the organised chaos that goes into making the story happen and when the killer takes their place in an empty box as a vantage point it affords us the sight not only of the performance but also off stage the smoke machine, the fans, the bird wranglers, the stage hands in the wings. We literally see behind the curtains. The kills in this while relatively few certainly leave their mark. The, the first murder of Betty's boyfriend is brutal and bloody with the knife going into his throat and up into his mouth, defensive wounds through his hands as he tries to fend off the knife attack. It's intense, concentrated, and as nasty as anything we've ever seen in a previous Dario Argento movie. The wardrobe lady's death is horrible, and for a film whose entire ethos, as Argento explained it, was it's not what you don't see that scares you, it's what you do see. He came up with the idea of the needles under the eyelids because he became increasingly frustrated with people turning away at the gory or scary bits in his movies. He wanted to force them to watch it. So for a film that is constantly about being forced to watch uh, the horror, this kill is an exercise in restraint. You don't see what's going on. The, uh, the tracheotomy with fabric scissors is suggested and actually all the more powerful because of it. Um, the slow motion bullet through the peephole is the standing ovation. It's, it's no wonder that that clip makes it into every documentary or feature about the work of Dario Argento. And even later on, the completely over the top raven attack leading to an eye being plucked out and eaten by a raven is gleefully gloopy. All the wonderfully outlandish camera work you would hope for in an Argento movie is in full effect here. The film opens on a close-up of a raven's eye and reflected in that is the orchestra pit uh, practicing the opera. I noticed that the, the lead raven, if there is such a thing, has a white patch on its throat which to me has to be a nod to Edgar Allan Poe's Black Cat when the Black Cat uh, returns. It has a white mark on its chest and that cat ultimately leads to the demise of the, the, the cat killer in the movie in exactly the same way that the ravens ultimately enact their revenge on the killer in the movie. There's a swooping, swirling, diving raven's eye sequence that is as bold, bonkers and beautiful as anything Argento's put into celluloid at this point. There are shots of the killer's pulsating brain signifying his heightened state of alertness before the kill. There are flashbacks which are very loosely tied up at the end but it doesn't matter because the flashback now is the, the language of Dario Argento's cinema. If you're up to speed you, you understand already you can hit the ground running as soon as we flash back to a memory we know that it's not going to be a 100% representation of what happened. It might even be a dream. The film suggests that the memory may be a dream or the memory of a dream and that we're going to be missing key details, that we're not going to know necessarily who is having these dreams, flashbacks or memories. So they can be dropped in almost like extra spicy ingredients. And if you're in on it, you know exactly where you are. If you're coming to opera as 
your first Argento movie, this must seem like a weird little casserole of ingredients, things being lobbed in willy-nilly with almost uh, no sense. If you're in on the game though, you're in completely familiar territory. Argento is in familiar territory. He's wholly in command of the story he's telling and it's concentrated to the point, brutal and effective. The music in this works great. In his previous film, Phenomena, the music was a real eclectic mix, and I think it's fair to say that in that film, it had its fair share of hits as well as misses. Uh, the heavy metal tracks sometimes felt out of place in there. Here, swinging wildly between opera and heavy metal really works well. I've mentioned in previous reviews of earlier Argento films that I'm convinced that uh, Argento was an inspiration for the first Saw movie and that Saw was in many ways uh, a love letter and homage to the works of Dario Argento. After rewatching opera, I'm doubly convinced of this. Look at any scene where Betty is tied up, struggling with those needles under her eyes, a physical and mental torture endurance lit with the sickly green neon color that any fan of the Saw series will instantly recognize and tell me that those scenes don't scream of the Saw aesthetic. A final word of advice then, unless subsequent releases by Arrow and the like have given us a better English dub. Don't listen to the, the English dub, which is generally my default for watching Dario Argento movies because I like hearing the lead actor or actress use their own voice. Uh, if you're watching this for beers and giggles, fine, stick on the, the English dub. It's atrocious. I mean, it's comically bad. If you want to sit down and uh, seriously watch a Dario Argento horror movie, this is the one where you listen to the Italian track with English subs on. After opera, America came calling with trauma, which is what we'll be talking about next.